Just because a wrestler doesn't get the desired reaction doesn't mean they have done a bad job. Because if you can believe it, sometimes you can come up with a persona or you can come up with a character, you can throw it out there into the ring, and we all look at it and go, no, nah, I don't really understand what's going on. Now, eventually we do catch up and we're like, oh my gosh, how did I not see this before? But I bet for the performer in question, it is no fun at all. So hello, my name is Simon What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. And this is 10 Wrestlers the audience weren't ready for. Number 10, Goldust. Now this went far beyond the wrestling fan base because notoriously even wrestlers like Scott Hall in the mid 90s or don't want to work with Goldust for reasons that you're already thinking. Now, at first it seemed like WWF was presenting this character because they were going to be quite progressive. And then around about five seconds, it basically just fell into homophobia. And well, it was quite very insulting. And that was the other issue here too, because it became patently obvious that the powers that be expected fans to throw slurs towards the man in gold. And I'm sorry, but you should never be exploring that avenue ever. And in fact, it's really, really bad. Eventually, we did do a U-turn on this in 1996 when Goldust went babyface, basically by going, oh, by the way, I'm straight, which just makes you face palm. And don't get me wrong, Dustin Reynolds down the line would do tremendous things with this character. But my word, there was a lot of other stuff to get through. None of it was that cool. Number nine, Stone Cold Steve Austin as a bad guy. Yes, that is right. You all know the story. In 2001, following WrestleMania 17, Stone Cold Steve Austin went to Vince McMahon and said, I don't think I've got any more momentum as a good guy. You should turn me villain and I can be the top heel in the company. And do you know what fans did? They went, ha <laughs> ha. Nope, and they all switched off their television sets. But if you do go look at the numbers now, you can actually see the decline because there was a huge portion of the fan base that just wanted to cheer Steve Austin. They wanted to watch him drink beer, they wanted to watch him beat up the boss, and then just run around going, oh my gosh, I'm a rattlesnake. And Austin was probably ahead of the curve here because he could see which way the tide was turning. And yes, after a few months, people like me that hung around were like, man, this version of Stone Cold is absolutely hilarious but the audience absolutely wasn't ready for it to the point that if you ask Steve today, he will tell you, yeah, that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done it. Number eight, Michelle McCool. So this one is crazy, but on more than one occasion, Michelle McCool was told by WW officials, stop wrestling like a man and start wrestling like a girl. And as we know, this is where WWE was at the time, not that there's any excuse for it, because McCall was like, look, I can lock up, I can do an arm drag, I can do a power slam, I've got ring psychology, so I'm gonna go out there and do it anyway. But of course, by this point, WWE had already conditioned the fans not to accept this kind of stuff. So they would go to the toilet, or they go to the concession stand, or they go and get some popcorn. I mean, the whole thing was pretty much terrible. It meant that some of the best moments and awesome matches that Michelle McCall had went completely under the radar until we did get the women's revolution in 2015, 16, 17, 18, whatever the hell you want to say. And you can go back now and look at it and go, oh man, I saw what we were trying to do there. And look, it's good that WWE has caught up with it now, but flub me, it should have happened years earlier. Number seven, Orange Cassidy. I mean, we did a video about this at the time, so you can go back and watch it in 2019. I was a big fan of Orange Cassidy, but when it was announced that he was signed into AEW, some people on the internet just melted down because they couldn't believe it. Even though, you know, wrestling is meant to be super duper creative, but whatever. Now, of course, this was all situated around the fact that he was a comedy wrestler or that sometimes he would do kicks that had no effort put into them. The one thing that I never understood is he's not trying to hurt his opponent when he does this. You're not meant to be kicked and go, oh no, my shin, I'm absolutely broken. He's trying to wind you up. I mean, that ties into the whole facade. Soon forward to 2020 though, especially when Cassidy was feuding with Pac and you can see thousands of people in an all elite wrestling arena going crazy for this man because they have finally understood the gimmick. Sure, 99% of the time he can't be asked, but when you get under his skin, that man can go. My word, do I like me some Orange Cassidy. Number six, Bret Hart. Now you can argue this one, and I want to make it very clear that I think Bret the Hitman Hart is one of the best wrestlers, if not the best wrestlers of all time. But if you do go back to the mid 90s when he became the world heavyweight champion and then go look at the numbers, it's fair to say he didn't set the world on fire. And a huge reason for this was because he wasn't Hulk Hogan and Hulkamania had taken over the entire world. But over in Europe, fans were in love with Bret the Hitman Hart, me being one of them. And look how we all perceive Bret now. 
you could essentially return to any single one of his matches ever and go, well, you could plonk that in 2022 and it would be as good now as it was back then. And I truly do think as time goes by, the respect for Hart goes up and up and up because his body of work is so good, which of course means while maybe not everybody was buying into his shtick back then, today he is considered a damn hero and a damn legend. And that's basically because he is. I mean, the way he used to take front turnbuckle shots, my word, he rocks. Number five, Shawn Michaels. This is pretty much the exact same story I did just tell, which is kind of ironic, because of course, for most of their careers, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels were at odds with each other. But yeah, it was the same kind of a deal. When Shawn Michaels was made the World Heavyweight Champion in the mid-90s, he didn't set the world on fire either because he wasn't Hulk Hogan. Once again, how does everybody feel about the heartbreak kid now? He's one of the best wrestlers ever. Oh my gosh, he's so good. Those two matches with The Undertaker at WrestleMania are brilliant and they changed my life. This goes on for days. I mean, go out there and try and find a bad match he had. There's also this huge debate that can be had about Shawn Michaels round one and then Shawn Michaels round two. And really when he did come back after his back injury, he was even better than ever. And it was during this phase when everybody went, oh man, that's Shawn Michaels. He knows what he's doing. Which of course begs the question, what if he had never returned? What would we be saying now instead? Number four, Tetsuo Naito. When Naito won the 2013 G1 Climax, the whole point is that the fans were gonna get behind him and go, oh my gosh, he's our brand new hope. We absolutely adore him. And well, it didn't really happen like that. It's not like New Japan wasn't aware or didn't acknowledge this either, because as he did go into his feud with IWGP champion Okada, Okada basically used to point to him and go, ha Naito, Remember how you're meant to have a bond with these people? Well, they don't even like you. What are you going to do? It got so bad that when the promotion asked fans to vote on what should be the main event at Wrestle Kingdom, they didn't vote for Ocado versus Naito, which meant they had to be moved down the card. However, after he took a little trip to Mexico and basically reinvented himself as a bad guy, he did such a good job that when he came back to New Japan, all of a sudden from nowhere, everyone was like, oh, we get it now and we want to marry him. He soon became an absolutely crazy merchandise seller too and became the world champion. And ever since then, he's never really looked back. Number three, Kenny Omega. So as far as I'm concerned, Kenny Omega is one of the best professional wrestlers in the world. And the reason I think this is that he will put himself out of his comfort zone constantly. He will do normal matches, he will do hardcore matches, he will wrestle a doll but it's what I just said that has confused a lot of fans because they watch this stuff and they don't really get it. Or at least they certainly didn't at one point because all it takes is a quick Google search of people going, oh, Kenny Omega is so overrated. Oh, he did this, he did that. Until really he got to AEW and went, do you want to watch me have absolute bangers every single week? And he did that and then it was quite clear he was doing it in New Japan beforehand as well. And he just went up and up and up and up and up. So I think what really happened through his match quality and the fact he spoke about this in interviews is that we all realized this is one creative guy who gets his creativity out in wrestling and just look at his body of work. So I don't care if he wants to wrestle a tomato after this, I will pay my 50 bucks and I'll bet you right now, Kenny Omega versus a tomato would be better than 78.2% of all wrestling matches that year. Number two, Bray Wyatt. Now this one is kind of hard to go through because my word, the peaks and troughs with this. But when Bray Wyatt decided to become The Fiend in 2019, a lot of us, me included, scratched our heads going, but he's a child TV presenter now? I don't really understand what's going on and why is he surrounded by puppets? Before long though, the true genie of this shone through. We're like, oh my gosh, Bray Wyatt, you're the greatest pro wrestler ever. But then Vince McMahon and the WWE creative team also sunk their teeth into it. And then it got really weird again, but we kept trying to like it, but then it just got confusing. And the whole thing before he got released was an absolute mess. So I don't know whether he was a wrestler the fans weren't ready for, or he was a wrestler that the powers that be weren't ready for. But what I do know is that in no universe did I expect to be standing here in 2022 and tell you that Bray Wyatt, who has come up with a bunch of awesome things in wrestling, ain't even employed by a wrestling promotion right now. So I suppose it comes down to logic and the fact we decided to burn him alive. I'm still trying to work through that one, but maybe we will get to like 2034 and all of a sudden I'll understand. Maybe not. Number one, Roman Reigns. I mean, this one stands to reason. If you go through 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and some of 2020, fans did not like Roman Reigns. They had decided that Vince McMahon had taken the big dog and was trying to stick him down their throat. 
and they weren't going to take it anymore, so they, whoop, they threw him back up and they spat in their face. I mean, there was even a time when he won the Royal Rumble, got endorsed by The Rock, and the audience still booed him. It really looked like that we were going to have to draw a line under this and move on. But kind of amazingly, after the global pandemic did hit, and I suppose Roman had more say in his character, he came back as a bad guy, he came back as the tribal chief, he came back as the head of the table, and all of a sudden he had created something great. And now go and listen to the reactions on SmackDown. Finally, he has arrived at his place. I mean, this really should underline to WWE that if something isn't working for the love of everything, would you change it and not wait five years? However, remember, better late than never, but better never late. And also, I think this new version of Roman Reigns is absolutely fantastic. Long live the king or the tribal chief, whatever the flub you want to call him. Not of any other wrestlers that the audience weren't ready for, make sure you let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like the video, share the video and subscribe. Then head over to whatculture.com where you can read articles like this with your eyes and make sure you do use them, otherwise they may stop working. You don't know, that could be a thing. Make sure you watch another video here on YouTube and make sure you come follow us on social media because it's the most 2022 thing ever. My name is Ivor What Culture. Excuse my voice, I have somewhat of a cold, but I appreciate you joining me. See you soon. Hello there dear friends, Corporate Cleary here, dressed like a substitute teacher to give you some exciting news. First of all, between now and the 15th of February, that's right, that is the Boxing Day on Valentine's Day, we have 20% off everything. Point two is we are going to come up with a brand new shipping method that will not be tracked and will take quite a long time, anywhere between 2 and 12 weeks, but will be a fraction of the cost. Hey, hey! So that is 20% of everything that's currently on the What Culture store and far, far cheaper shipping methods. Head over to shop.whatculture.com for all of this stuff. It's available there. Anything we sell, 20% off. Go and enjoy the claw. Sorry, you have to please, please, please forgive me. I must deal with a staffing issue. Goodbye.